Colin2220 and its Patrides2221 came out recently and they're filled with new goodies for you as Kotlin developers. We're bringing new data flow checks right into the compiler and we're making contracts more powerful. Kotlin for WebAssembly graduates to beta and gets new in-browser debugging support out of the box. On mobile, we're bringing experimental support for Swift export available right from the get-go. And we're improving the Kotlin Standard Library's common atomics implementation. Now, those are just some of the highlights. There's a lot to talk about. Let's dive right in. Let's start our journey on the language level with new experimental data flow based exhaustiveness checks. Let's see, I have a user role enum like I do have here with admin, manager, and user. Now I want to create a mapping function that returns me a security clearance as an integer. So I could write something like get security clearance for user role and that takes a user role and returns me an integer. Now the simplest implementation of this function would of course just be a when statement that assigns some values to each role. And already we can see that the Kotlin compiler has some pretty cool exhaustiveness checks. So for example, if I forget the user, it will complain that I've not assigned a value. And since I'm returning on this, uh, it actually needs to have a user branch provided. Adding that back fixes it. But in reality, of course, functions like these, even mapping functions can become quite complicated. So you might find yourself in a situation where you've already checked the admin role and you've assigned a value of 99. Now in this scenario, you would not have an admin branch down here in your return when statement because you've already checked the admin role and returned a value above. But the problem is that up until now, the Kotlin compiler didn't really understand what was going on here. It still wanted this when expression to be exhaustive because it did not take into account any of the other context around this when statement. This is something that we're now making possible. So I'll head over to my build file and I'll add the data flow based exhaustiveness check free compiler argument. And by doing that, we can now see that the data flow analysis actually checks and sees that, well, for user role admin, a value was returned and for manager and for user as well. So this is a well-formed function that covers all the branches of user role. So with this flag, the compiler is able to infer more constraints about your code, which means that it can accept this code that was already correct, but beforehand was rejected because it wasn't sure yet. Now that's just a bit of extra flexibility for you. Speaking of flexibility, here is one more language level change. Let's take a look at this. I have a function called get display name that takes a string and returns a string. And I want to create a sibley function called get display name or default, which takes a nullable string and always returns a regular string. I want to do it using an expression body. Um, so we want to write something like get display name for string. And if there's no string, then we'll just return unknown. Now, as we can see, as it stands, Kotlin doesn't accept this. Why? Because so far returns have been prohibited in functions that use an expression body. And instead you're encouraged to use a block body instead. But as you can see with a small function like this, it's a legitimate use case to want to return some default value even when using the expression body syntax. We will be allowing this in Kotlin 2.3 and you can already use it today you simply have to pass a flag to change your language version to Kotlin 2.3. After a quick re-import, we can actually see that this now works as well. So once again, Kotlin gets a tiny little bit more expressive. Moving on, Kotlin 2.2.20 has a bunch of new improvements for Kotlin contracts. These are things like generics in contract type assertions. Uh, you can add contracts to property accesses or specific operator functions. There's a new holds in keyword, so you can assume conditions are true when they're passed inside lambdas. Uh, there's a lot of details here, but I do want to show you one of these things in action, which is the new returns not null function that makes sure that non-null return values um, are are actually inferred correctly when specific conditions are met. Let's just see it in practice. Okay, back in the IDE here, we're looking at the following scenario. We got a function called decode, which takes a nullable string and returns a nullable string. Let's look at the actual implementation. We can see that if the input string is null, then this function also returns null. Otherwise, it always returns a non-null value that comes from some external API. This part doesn't really matter. So we can call this decode function uh, with a non-null argument and we will immediately spot a bit of an issue. Well, 
the return value of decode is a nullable string. So even though we as developers know that when we pass a non-nullable argument, we will always get a value, the Kotlin compiler doesn't know this. It infers string question mark and nullable string, so it will force us to actually use a safe call or a non-null asserted call uh, when we want to access properties of that decoded variable. Now our recent changes to Kotlin contracts allow us to actually express exactly this type of constraint to the Kotlin compiler so that it will check correctly. Let's write it up. Let's write a contract and make sure we opt in for experimental contracts. And then we'll just say string not null implies returns not null. And of course, I also need to make sure I also opt into experimental extended contracts. And with this, we can now see the changed color scheme. Why? Because the Kotlin compiler can now appropriately smart cast our invocation of decode or well, its return value to be a non-nullable string. So it has successfully smart cast to Kotlin string and this invocation is now valid. To enable these new types of contracts, make sure that in your build system, you have specified the compiler argument for allow condition implies returns contracts as well. This is really cool because it allows you to tighten down those type signatures a little bit more. There's also a bunch of other small changes that are relevant to Kotlin developers as a whole that we're not going to get into so much here. These are, for example, our experimental support for reified types in catch clauses, which means that inline functions can now use reified generic type parameters. We also have a new implementation for how when expressions uh, actually generate their bytecode on the JVM using the more modern invoke dynamic instruction. This generates smaller bytecode, which is quite neat. And we've also made changes to overload resolution. So now if you have two functions, one of them that takes a suspending lambda and one of them that takes a regular lambda, you can now specify uh, using the suspend modifier which overload you want your code to pick. This again requires your project to be on language level Kotlin 2.3. For our next section, I'm actually going to pop into an earlier version of Kotlin, Kotlin 2.120. Because in Kotlin 2.120 was the first time that we've introduced common atomic types. They're experimental and effectively they just allow you to use atomic abstractions in platform independent common code. And with Kotlin 2.220, we are adding a bunch of new functions to their API. Let's see it in action because that's a great way to learn. Let's work with an atomic integer. I'll do an atomic int. And this one comes from the Kotlin concurrent atomics package. So this is a multi-platform implementation. We'll give it a default value to start. And since they're experimental, we'll also make sure we opt into that API. Now I can do the typical things that I want to do with atomics. For example, I could start hundred threads and then I could grab myself my atomic int and I could use one of the new functions that we have as part of Kotlin 2.2.20. For example, update or fetch and update. So in this case, I'll just increment the value by one on each of the independent threads. This is of course an atomic update and it also has the special property that for example, when something was concurrently updated, this transform function just gets executed again. So you always make sure that by the end of this, you've run through 100 increments. For the cases when you also want to get a value back, uh, you can also now do things like atomic int dot update and fetch making a change to the value and getting that new value assigned to your variable or as an alternative as our value two, uh, we can also use fetch and update, which first gets us the value of atomic int as it was and then applies the update transformation. Beforehand, you had to kind of work around to get this kind of behavior, but since this is pretty basic stuff, uh, we wanted to make sure that it's of course also included as part of just the standard API. And before we wrap up our chapter on the standard library, there's one more subject, which is arrays that also gets something cool. So here we have an array of fixed size of three and I want to make it bigger. So for example, I might want to create a second array, which is a copy of the first one, but instead it's supposed to have six elements. The Kotlin standard library has this function already, uh, but it does come with a bit of a caveat, which is that now we all of a sudden have an array of nullable strings. It kind of makes sense because you need to initialize the values somehow. Uh, so the most obvious choice would be to null initialize them, but that changes your signature. Now we're adding a new overload that allows you to instead 
provide an initializer function that gets the index at which an element is initialized and allows you to create a value like that. So for example, I might write code like this and I will also make sure that I opt into this experimental API. And now we can see that we have an array that actually has six elements in it, but that are still all non-nullable. Smaller changes, but in typical Kotlin fashion, they all work together to make one better programming language. Moving on to the Kotlin multi-platform world, Kotlin for WebAssembly is now in beta. This is really exciting for a couple of different reasons. One of them, of course, being that Kotlin for WebAssembly is the underpinning technology for Compose multi-platform for web. So here, more stability always bodes well. But the standalone technology itself also gets a bunch of different things. Not just stability, but improvements for NPM dependencies, exception handling in the JavaScript into op space. And one of the things that I want to show off to you, which is built-in browser debugging support right out of the box. Back in the IDE, I've opened one of our Kotlin Wasm browser template projects. This is also one of the ones you can find on GitHub. And I can just run this project and I can open it up in my local browser. If you've written all your code correctly, I guess this is where the story ends. I oftentimes make mistakes, which is why I'm so excited that I can now just inspect this page. I can head over to the sources tab and then under source wasm.js Kotlin, I can see all the Kotlin code uh, that actually powers this website. And what's more is I can, for example, also set breakpoints and the debugger will stop as soon as this function is invoked. Uh, I can step over some uh, individual instructions and I can see over here, for example, uh, that I got different values for my variables. And as my sum gets computed, uh, I also get the final value here. So I can really step through the entire code and see what's going on. This is super powerful because I can do it right inside the browser's dev tools, which is really, really nice. As a personal note, I found that the debuggers in the Chromium-based browsers tend to be the best for WebAssembly. But I, of course, I got my fingers crossed that the other browser engines out there will keep step. Huge news if you're a mobile developer using Kotlin multi-platform as well. Why? Because Kotlin 2.2.20 is the first version that has experimental support for direct Kotlin to Swift export. That's right. With this new implementation, there is no need for Objective-C headers anymore. It's a pretty cool change. Let's see it in action. Back in the IDE here, I am in the Swift export sample project, which you can also find as part of the what's new page. Inside the common main directory as part of one of the modules, I have some place where I can write some Kotlin code. So for example, here I can write something very simple like add three numbers, A, B, and probably also C. Okay, what do I need to do to actually call these from Swift code? Well, the setup is already done in this project, so we can really focus on what the call site looks like. Here, I'm in my Swift UI code, I have a text element, and now I can just call this exact function that I have here. Add three numbers, we will use the syntax that uh, Swift uses, so we can do so something like seven, B is five, C is seven. And then if I run this application, we indeed get that the sum of these numbers is 19. So this is probably the most simple example of a Kotlin function being called directly from Swift code. But even in this experimental preview version, Swift export is already pretty powerful. You have multi-module support. So each of your Kotlin modules is actually exported as a separate Swift module. You can use type aliases. You have support for the Kotlin package declarations. Uh, we've made sure that nullability for primitives works well. Overloads, um, the way that the package structure actually looks like, module name customization, and a whole bunch of other things are already in there. So we very much encourage you to try it out and also try the example project that we have. If you want to use it in your own project, the What's New page also includes instructions on how to enable Swift support uh, in your own applications. It's really cool and we need your feedback for it, so please give it a try. And by scrolling down, you can also find that sample project that's already pre-configured for you. Now it is still experimental, which is good to keep in mind. So I can also recommend checking out the documentation page for Swift export directly uh, and taking a look at the current limitations so that you have an understanding of what works and what doesn't. Of course, we are working hard to make sure that the most important cases are covered as soon as possible. Since we were already kind of talking about iOS, it's a good point to also talk about our new experimental flag for smaller binary sizes. Uh, it is just called small binary and it effectively just sets a different optimization argument for the LLVM compiler that's used to generate the native binaries for Kotlin native code. 
Now in practice, this makes your Kotlin native release binary smaller. Of course, you're encouraged to measure by how much yourself, but John here, for example, uh, has seen a reduction of over 20% in his release builds when using our new small binary flag, which is really exciting. There's a small caveat with this, which is since we're changing the default optimization arguments for the LLVM compiler, uh, there are some scenarios where this might affect your runtime performance in some few cases. Best to check it out yourself. Now, Kotlin is always evolving and there's always more to learn, uh, which is why our wonderful tech writers have updated a whole bunch of documentation pages uh, to make sure that you always have the latest and greatest information for learning Kotlin. And you can find all of that information as part of the What's New page as well. And there's a whole bunch more changes as part of Kotlin 2.2.20. Things like stable cross-platform compilation for Kotlin libraries, a new common dependencies block that lays the foundation to move your common dependencies out of the source sets and into the general Kotlin block of your configuration. Reflection gets new functionality as well with things like is interface. There's a lot of things worth checking out in this release and the What's New page has all the details and gives you a good idea of where you can leave feedback, especially on the experimental features. And before I go, the last major release, Kotlin 2.2, also had a bunch of really neat features, which we covered on this channel. So maybe check that out next. As usual, thank you for being a part of the Kotlin community. You help shape the language that we all love. Thanks for watching and have a nice Kotlin. Take care.